they all have some some level of uniqueness attached to them and it makes it interesting and then when you can you know have really great conversations with people and connect with people that's a lot of fun too Hey, 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 welcome to Loan Officer Growth Podcast, the podcast that helps LOs with their business, increase their success, and have more freedom. So today, we have a good, good friend of mine, Tony Tony Taylor, but did you change your name? I didn't. No, it's still Tony Taylor. Oh, perfect. <laughs> she just got married recently, but Tony Taylor uh, also runs a company, Interconnect Mortgage. That's a brokerage, right? Yeah, but sure. Own is. brokerage, and I like to say Tony's an expert at AI, um, and the mortgage AI included in the mortgage business. So w- hopefully, we'll talk about some cool things with that too today. How are you doing, Tony? I'm doing good, Richard. How are you doing? Thanks for oh, having me. Wonderful. I'm feeling good this week. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Yes. So, so what, uh, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself, how you got started in the business and, and all of that fun stuff. Yeah. So I'm a dinosaur. I've been around since 1990 in the business and I've kind of worked in every position in the industry. I started as a customer service rep at the front desk and worked my way up into to wholesale. I was a wholesale account executive. I was a um, sales manager and then I went into actually running a wholesale company Uh, underwriting authority, et cetera. And then when the financial crisis happened, I transitioned back into the broker space. And so I've been brokering really since 2009, 2010 into that, that arena. I'm not sure exactly of the dates, but that's it. So here I am and, um, you know, fighting my way through like everybody else in 2020, you know, the beginning of 24 and actually kind of excited about what I think is around the horizon for all of us that have made it through the last couple of years. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, I was reading an article, gosh, this morning that talked about, I guess they interviewed the Fed chairman and and he's saying that they're going to drop rates a couple times this year. So it, it seems like it's going to happen sooner than later. Yeah, I don't, I'm not even worried about that. I, I'd like stabilization, you know, like the, the rates being up or down, as long as they're stable, I feel like people adjust. Right. But, you know, what was hard was they were so volatile and obviously in the wrong direction. And I think every time they spiked them up, especially when they were doing 50 basis points, the whole you know country just kind of got rattled and everybody would pause. So you'd have these clients in motion. They'd come out and make an announcement and then everybody would hit the pause button. Right. So if we can just stabilize and, you know, keep going and then, you know, good, bad or otherwise, there's been some attrition with, you know, other licensees in the business and they've moved on to new careers. And so, you know, there's fewer of us fighting over the same amount of business. So that should help as well, just because there's less, you know, there's the the number of transactions has not gone up at this point, to my knowledge. And but there's less people fighting for that business. So hopefully right. we'll get back to some level of normalcy. Yeah, that's a good point. Really good point. That's awesome. So what, what, um, I know this is a weird question, but (laughs) what do you love most about what you do? Oh gosh, probably the diversity of what we do. So if I had to, you know, I grew up in Michigan and, you know, so around factories, a lot of factories, farms, things like that, very rural part of the, the state. And I think about people that went to work in factories that would punch, punch a piece of metal through a machine And Mm. all day long, that's all they would do, right? I would never have survived that environment. So I think, and when I look back through my career and my journey, I think I landed in all those positions because I would figure something out, get pretty proficient at it, and then I would get a little bored. (laughs) But I want to go do something else and I'd keep advancing up. So I think that that diversity, it it just always is interesting. There's very very few transactions that are the same. They all have some some level of uniqueness attached to them and it makes it interesting. And then when you can, you know, have really great conversations with people and connect with people, that's a lot of fun, too. Um, I'm not going to my my personality, the details (laughs) are not something I love. I would much rather have human interaction and let somebody else have to cross the T's and dot the I's. I can do it, but it's not my happy space. So you have team members. What is what's your team look like? Yeah. So so I have, um, yeah, they, they really do. Like, so 
I am really the marketer. I'm the one that's trying to make the phone ring and drive the traffic. And then I have two loan partners that are both licensed. And then I have a loan officer assistant or a loan partner assistant. So she does a lot of answering phones. She actually supports me at a very high level with technology and things like that. She gets all the documents into the systems and tees the team up for analyzation. She even helps us do a little bit of follow-up on things. And then I do have a couple of other people that carry their licenses with me, but we're a small company. We're licensed in five states and, um, and that's how it works. So it's basically when the lead comes in, um, it depends. Sometimes I talk to the client, somebody on the team sometimes talks to the client first, and then we basically go to work with it, try to get it qualified and then get them into contract as quickly as we can. Interesting. So what does your day look like? Let's say you walk in Monday morning. What does that look like? Yeah. So I make a lot of phone calls. Um, I actually, you know, I'm doing some cold market lead gen now, which is a new space for me. Um, but what I do try to do every day to every other day is call every single lead in that system. I have some AI that's attached to it that's helping to nurture and try to cultivate that as well. But I literally will come in and try to make my phone calls first thing. But and I say first thing after I have another girl that works for me, I should disclose she's a couple hours a day. She does some database calling for me. I get her uh -huh. launched off on her calls. I do a little pipeline call with my team team where we review everything. And then I jump into making phone calls. So it depends. I mean, yesterday I came in, I had eight appointments throughout the course of the day. It was kind of back to back. And then um, today I had, you know, a title person in my office because we're working on putting a class together in a couple of weeks, we're going to do a webinar. And so he was in here. So we're working on that. Then today's Tuesday. So I was calling everybody in the pipeline and getting them updates. I like to do those calls. Um, I actually enjoy them. And I feel like it's been a, it's probably been one of the things, one of the activities I've done that has helped me keep my head afloat in the last couple of years. Right. Um, because every, even this month, I think we had two transactions that are the result of relationships that were born out of last month's transactions. Mm. So, you know, staying fresh with them, keeping alive with the agents you're already engaged with and that really like working with you and stuff. And then adding to that by working those relationships through the, the Tuesday calls. Um, Wednesday, I'm actually going and teaching a class inside of a real estate office. Um, so I'll do that tomorrow in the middle of the day. And then on the front end and the back end of that, I'll do more phone calls. Um, Thursday, it'll be more phone calls. <laughs> so I do a lot of phone calls and I will spend some time trying to work on the marketing and refining presentations. You know, there's little tweaks that I'll come back and make, or maybe I'll customize something to, you know, make it more applicable to the, the class, the room that I'm going to go speak to. And it's rinse and repeat pretty much on a daily basis. You know, sometimes I will take an app here and there, but it just, you know, most of it is, is follow up lead gen and trying to get more deals in the door. So what do you, what do you think you, how, how many hours a day do you make outbound phone calls? Oh, it depends. <laughs> um, I, you know, yesterday I probably was outbound dialing for an hour and a half. Okay. Um, I have a dialer that's really efficient for me. And I probably, with my cold leads, those don't take very long with a dialer um, just because you get a lot of voicemail. Some of the numbers are not good, you know, so you're plowing through those pretty quick. I did like 37 phone calls in 30 minutes. Right. Oh, nice. So, but I didn't, you know, yesterday, um, again, it was, I had appointments. So I was on the phone with realtors. I was on the phone, you know, with financial planner. I had a meeting with an investor that I was talking about some product guidelines. So outbound traffic, you know, on a daily basis, I would tell you pretty safely, I'm no less than probably two hours a day that I'm calling. And the okay. one exception is I try to keep my calendar. It doesn't always work, but I try to keep Fridays um, a little bit more clear, but I'm finding, you know, as of late, if, if that's the only time that I can get somebody in my books, then they're going in my books and I'll make the calls and I'll have the meetings on those days as well. And it's for a little bit of the fall over the spillover, right? Maybe things that I wanted to get to, but I couldn't get to Monday through Friday. And then sometimes, you know, I'm at a breakfast, I'm, you know, I'm just doing, you know, trying to be out there, but be um, focused at right. the same time. So it's every, every week is a little bit different depending on standing meetings. Tomorrow I'll come in. I have a meeting that is once a month at 7 a.m. And it goes from 7 to 9. So I'll be on a Zoom meeting for two hours with 60 people. And it's financial planners and attorneys and, you know, things. It's my, it's my BNI, if you will. Um, and we do that. So it's a little different every day. But I'm lead genning. Really, they're all lead gen activities. Right. 
So let's say you come in today and you just don't feel it. You don't, the last thing you want to do is pick up the phone. What do you do? How do you, how do you, how do you get past that and hit the phones? Cause a lot of people fall into that issue. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny and I probably do something a little different every day in that regard, if I have it. Um, and, and here's what I do find is if I come in and I'm having like if my head's not in the right space and, and this is with a fine line, cause you could, you can get your, yourself in the wrong headspace every day if you really don't like calling, but I really, um, unless it's really bad, then I make those calls. Now, if I feel like I'm going to make those calls and I'm not going to be the person that's going to attract other people. And then I, then it's not, it's too costly to make the calls. I'm trying to think of an example that I had. I had this play out. I can't remember what had happened. It had nothing to do with a transaction, but I had something I, I, I can't remember. It was external, but I was like, I knew that my head wasn't in the right space and I gave myself permission. I mean, I made um, over 500 phone calls last month. So myself, that's not counting my team. So if I have a day, <laughs> Right. Like I'm going to give myself permission to recover right. if I if I do have a time where I'm just not feeling it for some reason or another. Right. I'll just try to get up and move around, get some something to drink and then, you know, refocus and start to look at the positives and start to look at, OK, no, these are these are good activities and just get it done. You know, um, not to just go through the motions. Right. But what I have learned, I used to hate calling. And what I have learned is that if you're doing a good job and you're calling people you actually like, then calling is actually not that hard. Um, the dialers help because if you have, I think the bigger problem is, and we don't talk about this very often, but I think a lot of us suffer from attention deficit. Right. And I think the dialers help because they make you stay on the task. I think that if you're trying to manually dial and you're wrestling with that affliction, if anything pops up anyplace else, it's very easy to run over to that and pay attention. Right. So I think for me, dialers are very helpful because I know that that next call is coming, whether I want it or not, and I've got to stay in the game. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's just kind of, what's that? Do you use phone burner? Is that? Or... I do, but I'm moving away from it. Um, I have a CRM that's actually got a dialer built into okay. it. And I actually, um, boy, I actually like it. I, feel, I use Jungo and I feel like the Jungo phone burner is pretty clunky and this new system I just feel like is a lot simpler and it goes, it, I, I like it. I think it's going to be a really good, we're still, it's fairly new for me. I've started to put it into place in November, December, and um, I'm still getting it up and going, but the more I use it, the more I like it. And that's when I do those cold leads, they come into that system. I do all of that dialing from there and it literally, like I said, 30, 35 minutes, I did 37 phone calls. Wow. So yeah. tell me about these cold leads because we we you spend a lot of time on warm leads. Yes. Yeah. And um, you don't want to you don't want to let your warm leads suffer. Right. Um, that is really, really important. So what I'm doing is I am running, you know, Google ads and Facebook ads. Um, and what I'm, what I really am doing for a lot of reasons, number one, cause this is a new space for me. So it may sound like it's not my highest and best use, but because I'm playing with what, what works and what doesn't work. And, uh, and I'm not the pro on this. This is a new space for me, but from what I can tell so far, it doesn't matter who's making the phone call. Sometimes they answer, sometimes they don't. Right. And you could have made the call and I could make the call. They don't answer the phone. The outcome's the same. Right. So the people that do answer the phone is, you know, it's like, okay, well, what am I doing anything that's actually getting them to engage with me? And the way that I'm trying to approach it, because I want to refine this. And, and hopefully when I do start to involve somebody else in my team to make some of these calls, hopefully I will have the conversation starters refined to the point that we can capitalize on a higher pull through and engagement. Because I need people to have conversations with them. If, if I can't have a conversation with them, then it's going to go nowhere. Right. So I'm still working with that. Interesting. Sounds but like at fun. this point, you know, I don't, I'm sure there's somebody out there, like I said, that's got it dialed up, but I'm being very transparent. Um, I'm just being very forthcoming. Sometimes I leave a voicemail. Sometimes I don't. Um, if I do leave a voicemail, I tell them exactly who I am and how I got their information because I figure, you know, honesty is built on trust and your behaviors and your little steps and your transparency start to instill that. So I just try to be very, um, very calm 
and introduce who I am. I let them know that their information came in through either a Google ad or a Facebook ad. And I'm just here to make sure that any and all questions that they have are getting answered. And here's our information. Um, if I get a voicemail, you know, sometimes I leave a message, sometimes I don't. You know, I kind of play with that to see whether or not they're calling back if I don't leave the message or if they're actually responding. And then I'll send a text out and say, hey, I just left a voicemail, would love to connect. And, um, you know, again, just trying to play with those kind of a warm, not a, you know, I try to make sure I'm very calm when I'm making those calls because I want the person on the other end to feel that it's, right. I don't want it to, I don't want them to feel like I'm calling 50 people. I want them to feel like they're the only person I called. Right, right. Interesting. But I, like I said, I, I guarantee you there's somebody that's, uh, you know, in our circle that's way more experienced in that space. This is going to be new for me. I played with it a few years ago. I know it works. Um, I also know you got to be very careful, like you said, with your warm leads. You don't want your warm relationships to get suffer, suffer engagement because you're focusing on these cold leads. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So on Wednesdays, you call past clients? Yeah. We call past clients every day. Oh, you call me. I have, yeah, I have a girl um, that I started with me in um, right before Christmas, I guess it was maybe right after Thanksgiving in that, in that time frame. And right now, because I feel like we might be poised for some shifts, I am trying to move up my engagement from four times a year to, um, you know, five or six times a year nice. so we can stay super close with them. That's what I'm aiming towards. And so that's what we're targeting right now is she's just every single day, she's dialing for two, two hours, three hours. And that's all she does is database calls. Now she's not using a dialer right now. When I get her into the dialer, which hopefully she'll be into that in the next week or so, then she'll be able to increase her number and, and it will become a lot easier for her to actually make those dials. Nice. Now is she, is she, is her call to action to set up an appointment to talk with you? Or is her call to no, action to, to get the team. a lead? Yeah, to the team. It's to oh, the team. Okay. Her, her goal, yeah, her goal is to, you know, spark some kind of interest. Do you want to do a mortgage review? Do you want to, you know, is there anything that we can help you with? Checking in, letting you know we're here, letting you know we do refinances, not just purchases if you need anything. Um, just, you know, and she's actually really good. She normally averages a, an appointment a day. Oh, nice. So, you know, she's, she's, you know, getting 25 to 30 phone calls in right without the dialer. Once she goes on the dialer, she'll easily double that, if not more. Yeah. And, um, you know, and hopefully she'll increase the um, number of appointments as well. I like that. Yeah, that's great. So yeah. you mentioned AI. You have some AI working with your um, buyer leads, did you say? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. What's that look like? Oh my gosh. Um, I love it. So what happens is when the lead comes in off of the ad, immediately my bot, if you will, kicks in and says, Hey, you know, thank you for registering. And then it starts to try to work it into an appointment. Mm. Um, it really, it really, one of the things that I love about it is it's very conversational. So it, the goal is, you know, Hey, we saw you were making this inquiry. What's got you in the market for a home, you know? So it starts to actually ask questions to start to get to the emotional process of it. But the goal is for that to nurture them into the calendar. And we've actually had some people just show up in the calendar as a result of the bot doing its thing. That's nice. um, it will rotate it. It will do, it, it doesn't do any phone calling, but it will rotate from text messages to emails and so in, you know, obviously not everybody gives a good phone number or an email address. So it'll tell the system tells us whether the phone number was valid. It'll tell us whether or not the email is valid. Um, and I say valid. Is it a valid email? Yes or no. But we don't know that it goes to the person that, you know, actually clicked on the link. Right. Um, but yeah. So the system does do that. And then we basically I, I add the phone calling on top of it. And I, like I said, I try to call every day, but, you know, truthfully, it's been about every other day that I'm getting those phone calls. And what I do try to do is I can see who's newest into the system. So I do try to make sure that whoever hits the system that we're calling them as quickly as possible. So, you know, then the other stuff is just kind of, for lack of a better word, the cooler staying in front of them. And then they'll stay in the system. And then periodically, you know, as they cool off, we'll, we'll uh, send out some kind of a, you know, reactivation communication as well. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you because a lot of, a lot of, I think a majority of leads, I don't know what percentage, but there are people that are going to buy nine months 
plus. So yeah. how do you how do you continue to follow up with them? Is it a monthly drip after after the initial? Or? Yeah. So that system that I'm using now is new. So figuring out that cadence as we go further, that's going to be part of something that I'm going to have to figure out, right? But I think that monthly at the very minimum, making sure that they're getting something that's relevant to them, um, you know, because we don't want to go too far away. And the, and the other thing we've got to be all that we all have to be careful of is these new email laws. Right. So right. if you're communicating consistently, then you're not really sending off any flags. But if you're, you know, if you if you don't send an email and then all of a sudden you send out 3000, you're going to set some alarms off and jeopardize your servers getting shut down. So I think that it's super important to find this cadence to where you're always communicating relevant information in a way so that you can have the availability when you need it, but also not jeopardize your servers. Exactly. Yeah. And it's yeah, got so that's a little bit of a than... dance. Yeah, that's a little bit of a dance. I um I try to, you know, I try to stagger everything so that it doesn't just immediately try to push everything at once, you know, stagger it so that if I'm sending it out and I'll usually do 200 at a time hmm. and then stagger them because I don't want to I'm trying not to jeopardize my servers. Right. Exactly. And if you can't get email through, I mean, you know, that's going to be a real problem for some people. So if we can't get communication through, you know, it's what are we going to be back to snail mail again? <laughs> I you, mean, the well, way they're speak, going. Speaking of that, do you do any snail mail to your past client database? I do. I try. You know, it's it's costly, right? right. So I did one last, I don't know, I think it was in the summertime we did it. Um, I've, I've kind of been percolating on another one, but honestly, I'm just not, you know, it's like if we're calling them, is it, does it make sense for me to spend the five grand to drop out the pieces if we're calling them as frequently as we're calling them? Right. So I still think that a piece or two a year is a good idea. Um, but I, I definitely don't do it monthly. It's just way too cost prohibitive. How big of a um, database do you have? Well, when I do the mailers, I usually send out about 3,500 pieces. Oh, wow. So. Okay. Yeah. So my, um, my past clients that I call between people that have left us or unsubscribed or whatever, I'm, I'm about a thousand. So, um, but when I do the mailer, I will encompass more people into that. And so it, it gets to be expensive quick. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, and I don't know, um, maybe it would be better if I just did the past closed clients and not worried about, you know, the, and, and the people that we just have valid addresses on maybe that would make more sense to be in front of them more often. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, that's where we're headed these days. Interesting. Yeah. I always remember that 80, you have an 85% better chance of conversion. If you follow up a mail out with a phone call. Okay. And it always kind of makes me wonder how often should we be mailing out? Even if you, even if it's just to 500 once a month, it's cheaper, but you're, it's, you're getting that many more touches. Right. I don't know. I just thought about that. Yeah. I don't, I've never heard that metrics before, but now you're making me think it's like, okay, well, if I'm just dropping a mailer, but I'm not doing any kind of a following, you know, a parallel, maybe I am better off staggering it and having a few go out every month versus dropping large batches right right so, you know it's the facilitation of it all right like because um i don't have a printer behind me so i'm working with a third party to get the content to get the data sure. the variable data loaded and so you know like theoretically it, you know obviously doing it monthly would even spread the cost out but the compilation of the data management you know, I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't have anybody in my team that, that, that right. would be able to expedite that right now. So that's probably something that's falling to the wayside, but it could be managed better for sure. So what, tell me a little bit about some of the AI that you use for your business. Like what, okay. if, if I'm a loan officer listening to this podcast right now, what are some tidbits you could, you could drop to, uh, to help? Okay. So you have to learn how to prompt these machines and it doesn't matter what, what system you're in, you have to understand how to get out of it, what you want. 
And what I have learned is that it's incredibly valuable if you tell the machine, whether it's ChatGPT or Bard, and I, I like them for different things, um, but if you tell it who you want it to act as, so in, in something, you know, like, look, you may be the number one real estate agent, but the truth is you're doing a marketing piece. You want it to act like a, a marketer, right? You want it to act like a, a prize winning marketing person. So, you know, you, you can give it that responsibility. So it understands you want me to act in this expertise, right? You can ask it to understand um, or to operate in the psychological buying behaviors that your clients have. Mm -hmm. um, and then what am I trying to put out? Am I doing ad copy? Am I doing social media content? Am I doing, um, uh, you know, some other type of material. Um, and then, you know, this is what I want my end user, my end recipient to do. I want it to educate. I want it to entice. I want it to persuade. I want it to um, educate, whatever it is. And so when you get that output, the more robust that you get in your description about what you want. And one of my favorite things to do is tell the systems to ask me questions to better understand the task. So oh, I like that. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, it's been really helpful of, you know, hey, ask me every question you need to ask me so we can figure this out. Right. Um, I've been I've been studying a lot of stuff I never thought I would study. Here's what I've learned. I can put a mortgage together in my sleep, but marketing is something I didn't study. I didn't learn it. And so now I'm in this space and I'm being way more intentional, but I recognize I'm going to have to continue to learn and study. And there's no, you know, it's, it's like anything, the knowledge layers on top of what's already there. So I'm taking a lot of online courses and I'm trying to understand the concepts. You know, it's not that I have to follow somebody's blueprint per se, but right. I need to understand the concepts and the strategies and the thought processes. And so, you know, I've been studying hooks. And understanding, you know, how do you hook somebody in? I'm, I tend to be very direct. And if you think about marketing, marketing is the complete opposite. Right. You know, um, they don't come out. Nike says, just do it. I mean, how vague is that, right? I am a direct personality or or that's that's what I, the style that I've learned. So me operating the space of elusiveness is doesn't come natural to me at this point. So I'm having to learn and I'm having to really make sure that I take the time. And sometimes I get it right. And sometimes I get it wrong. I ran a webinar last week and I was marketing for it. And two days before the webinar, I was like, Oh, the hook is so wrong. Like I, that's where the problem was. And I, you know, it's like, okay, so we're going to do it again. And, um, you know, and now I'm going to go in and I'm going to spend some more time. And I understand I, I can't, I've been guilty of just getting it done instead of spending the time on the front end so that I could get, be more effective with the outcome. So I'm going to try it, you know, and maybe I'll get it wrong the next time, but hopefully I'll get it better than I did the last time. And then I'll keep building on that. Um, so I think the hooks are super, super important. If you think about pay attention to the things that you look at online, whether you're scrolling on Facebook or TikTok or Instagram or whatever your flavor is, right? Right. Pay attention to the things that you you actually catch yourself watching, hmm. and what's different from them to the things that you don't take pause on. Right, and then you know there's a something to do with a hook likely that's in there that's a little bit unique, you know. And there's usually several different elements that are part of that. Um, but th so that's what I'm trying to learn right now is how to be better in those spaces to be able to be more effective. Um, I don't know why people don't like a bull in a china shop <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> coming in through the front door and just being like, oh, blah. <laughs> but for some reason, everybody wants kind of the mystique. So we've, I've got to learn to be a little bit more mystique. Interesting. That's cool, though. Yeah, I never thought about some of that with chat GPT and, and the, the, you know, give, giving them right prompt is so important. But I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to me because I think that, um, and I, I don't know, you know, I guess most of us would probably like to believe we haven't been prey to a um, snappy advertisement, you know, um, but, but we all have because right. the people that write the advertisements are really brilliant and they're very creative and that's their area of expertise. Right. So we're over here, you know, putting together W-2s and pay stubs and, you know, filling in job gaps for people and analyzing credit and debt ratios and all these very analytical things 
And then when you jump over there, you've got to jump into this creative space. And so it's, um, it just, it's going to take some real intentionality to get better at it. Um, but you know, being aware of the battle. So now, now the intention can be put in and I I'm learning that I need to, when I'm going to go into that space, I need to allow myself some time to actually think about it and think about who my end user is and what I want them to do so that I can use that information to create the right prompts, to get the right information out of it. Right. You know, what's the pain? An easier way to say it is what's the pain of my target and how can I sell them to a solution to their pain? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's fun. I mean, between that and then, you know, obviously video is more and more relevant and I, or it's, it's been relevant for many years, but finding, trying to find technologies that are consolidated. Um, there's one that I love. It's called captions. I got sh Brad Bront shared it with me. And what I like about it is it has the AI in it. So you can build your script right in it. It has the teleprompter in it. It has the um, captions in it. It has the eye correction. So if you're reading your monitor, it actually makes it look like you're looking at your camera. Oh, wow. All the time. Yeah. So, and it's, and I can use it. So I always, my disclaimer is yes, I did AI. I wrote a book on AI, but I am, I'm still, you know, if I can do it, I promise you, you can do it too. And I like systems that are a little bit more, you know, simplified. I don't want something that's going to take me 30 steps to get it produced. Captions. And, that program is one of those programs. Yeah. Cap, you can't get it on a droid. So if you're on a droid, sorry. No, nope, I'm all <laughs> Mac. Get a different one. Good. But yeah, for a Mac, it's great. And I think if you're on a Mac computer, your phone will actually upload it right into your desktop. Nice. Yeah. It will. So that's one of my new, you know, tricks that I like. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's fun. I wish I had more time to play with it. Yeah, exactly. It, you can go down a rabbit hole pretty quick with that stuff. Yeah, you sure can. You sure can. Man, there are time flew by. What um, what words of encouragement do you have for a loan officer right now in the times we're in? I mean, I know we didn't even talk about business and so forth, but I know last year you had a stellar year regardless of what's going on in the economy. So what words of encouragement would you have for the times we're in right now? So here's the biggest thing that I've been become aware of. And I think that there's a lot of people that fit this description. I was operating for a really long time and it's really only been in the last, you know, three to six months that I've really become really aware of this. I thought that if I could be everything to everyone, I would pull more business. And I recognize now that what it was doing was burning me out. I felt overwhelmed constantly. Um, I was just really like, what can I do? I'm working hard. I'm throwing the kitchen sink at it, but I wasn't working smart and I wasn't working effective. And I ran into some people, I got involved in, in some other, you know, there's a professional group and there's a, a guy in there that, um, Dave Lorenzo he wrote this book called the 60 second sale. I, I met him at a breakfast and I bought the book right away and I went back and read it. And there were some other things that were happening around me that were kind of pointing to the same thing. And that was, you have to niche up. And I was guilty. I'm just a very, like, I'm so black and white. When somebody says niche, I think that everything's got to be this obscure product, right? But that's right. not necessarily the case. It's just, you find your area of specialty gift, what you want to do, what you want to focus on. And I really read, I read the book. I had my whole team get the book. And I really, that combined with the other things that I was running into were telling me, find this area of expertise and just focus on it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I started to do. I started to go, you know what, I'm not going to go out and tell everybody that I do everything because then nobody has any, any idea when to think of me. So I go out and I, I made the decision that I'm going to talk about reverse mortgages or I'm sorry, not reverse VA mortgages a lot more because number one, I love helping the veterans. Number two, I think it's an underserved community. Number three, you know, in our industry, because of the laws on VA, there's typically not a lot of negotiation on terms. It just, it's black and white. Right. That's what we have. We're going right. So that's the decision I made. And so I have my VA that helps me with some of my social media stuff. I'm like nothing but VA material going out. And I started to make sure that that's a conversation when I present myself, that that's an area that I'm highlighting that I work in. And instead of, and I'll tell you, you know, what, it, what it did for me was number one, it helped me settle my brain because 
it was so overwhelming. How much was I not getting done? Cause I didn't know where to start. Right. So I think if there's anything I could tell anybody that's listening today is settle your head, stop trying to be everything, pick one or two things that you can focus on and just work that plan. There's no such thing as rolling out a plan and that's it. You have to work the plan. And so even, you know, doing webinars, which is something new for me, I did my very first one last week um, and it was targeted towards real estate agents. I'm going to do that same webinar again. Now, you know, the old way of doing it is I would have launched a different topic, but I'm not going to because I believe I have something that's of value. So I'm going to continue to promote that topic and I'm going to continue to try to put people in the room on that subject matter. So I have two. I do one for AI and I do one for um, a, the MoveTube program. So, but that's it. Now I have tons of things that I could teach realtors on, but this is what I'm focusing on. And I need to get the message out. I need the repetition. I need the, you know, so, and I need to get better at my hooks and my messaging to be able to get in front of people that I couldn't get in front of the last time I did it. So that's probably the biggest thing I would tell you would be what I'm learning from people that are far smarter than I am and taking their direction and looking. I looked at other experts in their fields, some people that were in the top of their game in their industry. And this was a common thing. This isn't unique to mortgages. This is, doesn't matter whether, you know, think about doctors. You have a surgeon. They don't operate on every body part. They right. pick a they pick a part, right? You find attorneys, and this was something that I didn't even understand. But if you go to a um, immigration attorney, you'll have people that are, you know, at the very front end of, they, they represent companies that want to bring people in from other countries. Then you have people that are actually fighting deportation. Then you have attorneys that are, you know, so there's, even the, the same subject matter, right. they're not doing every part of the case. They're expert. It, they've become experts in one segment of that particular field. And I think it's the same thing here. And, and I just really started to see all these things hitting me at the same time, telling me, stop being everything, pick a couple things and be really good at it. You'll get the other business. It'll come because they'll say, hey, you're really good at this. Do you do this too? That makes right? sense. But yeah. now you can be more concentrated and go out there and send your message. And then I would just tell you to layer that with a unique way to say it. Find a way. VA is not new, but I have to find a way to talk about it that's different than everybody else. Hmm. That makes so a lot of sense. Yeah. Finding a, I yeah, love finding a way to stand out as you're around. That's awesome. Very, very cool. Yeah. So we'll see now, but I feel like every year we're better than we were last year. True. <laughs> well, it was awesome having you on. Thank you so much. No, thank you, Richard. No, you're so welcome. I appreciate the opportunity. Very, very cool. So I don't know if anybody ever wanted to reach you, how would they reach out? Is that something you're... Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. So my office number is 561-373-0371. My website is www.interconnectmortgage.com. It's I-N-T-E-R connectmortgage.com spelled out. And um, my email is team taylor at interconnectmortgage.com. Perfect. Well, thank you again. Awesome. And I appreciate your time. No, thanks for having me, Richard. I really appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.